Hello, everyone. I'm Brenda Moneyappen. I'm the Director of Programs here at the museum, and I'm happy to welcome you to the museum this evening. Um, I'm also quite pleased to have Iran Egozi and Jason Levine here. I'm sure you're all eager as well for a wonderful um, conversation and performance this evening. Um, Iran has probably been thinking about bringing Jason to MIT for a long time, but it was about a year ago when he and I talked about uh, how we might uh, bring Jason in front of the public uh, to have a conversation about what he does and why and how. And um, from that conversation, uh, develop tonight's program, as well as a coding workshop that Jason is going to lead on Thursday here at the museum. Um, I think there are a couple of spots left for that workshop, so if you're interested in joining us, um, please look online, uh, the same place where you got your ticket for this, this program tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Irana Gozi, who is professor of the practice of music technology at MIT, and you might know him better as co-founder of Harmonix. Thanks, Brenda. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm really excited today to be introducing uh, Jason to come talk to you all and perform for you all. Um, and then after that, uh, he and I will have a little discussion here and try to get you guys involved as well. Um, it's really awesome to see students of my class raise your hand. Students, hey, awesome. Um, it's, Jason is actually here for the whole week, and it's part of a residence that we're having. So he's giving this talk tonight, plus the workshop on Thursday that Brenda talked about. But he's also going to be lecturing in my class tomorrow for my class interactive music systems. And we'll be talking to students about their final projects and giving them some advice um, about that. So we're really looking forward to him working with us in that capacity. Um, I met Jason, God, we were talking about this, I think it was 2011. Um, it was when I was still working at Harmonix, and uh, the Connect had just come out, and there was this conference down at Carnegie Mellon called the Art and Code Conference, and they were particularly looking at ways to use code to make cool art using the Connect. So I went down there, as, as well as someone I see here from, from Harmonix as well, uh, Mike Mandel. And uh, Jason was doing this crazy performance where he was on stage with a screen behind him, and the Kinect was doing a 3D capture of his, of his position and his body. And that was being rendered onto the screen, but using waveforms. And it also turns out he's like one of the world's top beatboxing artists. So he was like beatboxing and doing this, this kind of hard to describe show. Um, and since then, he's just done more and more interesting things. And he'll talk about all of those. Um, today, so uh, I won't bore you with more introductions other to say that, again, I'm really excited to have Jason here. Jason, come on up. Hello, hello. Um, so my name is Jason, as you know, and I'm a computational artist and musician. I'm, I'm based in New York, but I grew up in Montreal. So I really appreciate the summer weather you guys are having right now. Um, so I've been interested in music and computers for as long as I can remember. And my parents took notice of my interest in computers. And so they went to a garage sale and picked up a used computer. So this was my first computer. It was the IBM PC Junior. Had 128 kilobytes of RAM and 4.7 megahertz CPU and no hard drive. So if you have no hard drive or any drive at all, what happens when you start up a computer? Well, I would just get this screen. Um, I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, but lucky for me, the, it came with a manual. So I taught myself uh, basic by writing these sort of choose your own adventure style text adventures. So something like, you see a door, open door. You enter a room with a lamp in it, turn on lamp. You see a dresser with a drawer, open drawer. There's a box in the drawer, and on and on. So I would kind of, I would spend all day trying to build these text adventures. But then every night, my father would come down. And because in these times, there was no sleep mode or really even screensavers, the computer had to be turned off. And since I had no hard drive, everything was erased. So I had this zen-like practice of trying to take the text adventure to the next level each day until all my work was erased. Um, and 
Uh, my father was talking with some friends uh, of my plight, and so one of his friends gave him a five and a quarter disc entitled DOS 1.1. Uh, so I didn't get the manual, but I was allowed to use it once in a while. So I still didn't have a hard drive, but I just basically left this drive in my computer all the time, and there was no games or much to do, so I just learned how to do batch files. And my one, my one sort of achievement was there was a, I edited the binary of the system kernel by hand, and I replaced all instances of exe with fun, and I swear to God, it, it worked executable files would not run until you renamed them .fun. I'm sure you can't do that anymore. But back, I, you know, I had a lot of time. So um, I was looking, clearly looking for fun in computers. And I found it at elementary school where they taught LogoWriter. So for those of you not familiar, LogoWriter was a programming language aimed um, for educators. And you had this little turtle, and you could say, you could draw a line by saying, go forward 10 pixels, turn right 90 degrees, and make all sorts of abstract geometry. But it was advanced enough you could also make some animations or even a game. Um, so it turned out I really liked it. And um, the moment I, I don't remember most of this, because obviously it was 1992. but. Uh, the moment that I do remember was when the three of us were put in a room and we were given five problems and we had to pick which three we were going to solve in this limited amount of time. And then we went to solving them. And I think it was my first experience of the sort of liveness that can happen in programming. So around the same time, or maybe a bit earlier, um, another friend of my parents invited me to perform with the Imusici de Montréal uh, Chamber Orchestra doing a Mo Mozart's music for children. And I had the cuckoo, which is the one-hold flute. And I had one job, and that was when the, to remember the time when the orchestra stops, and then I go, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. But the story was, they never knew when I was going to come in. And every time I invented some new rhythm, and they had to be on their toes to know when was the right time to jump back in. So basically, by age 11, I already had uh, a taste for liveness and coding, um, hacking you know, system-critical files without making a backup, and wild and unruly musical improvisations. And now, 25 years later, I'm taller. Um, <laughs> so uh, I did learn uh, spreadsheets and databases and touch typing and C in high school. But really, most of my energy was focused on this new high energy. I see you guys are all like, who are those bands? Um, it's, high, it's kind of high energy rock music that was coming out. And I liked it so much uh, that when I finished high school, I started a band with some friends and ended up dropping out of science and going to music school. I was never much of a bass player. But one thing that I really loved was all the pedals, the delays, the distortions, the reverbs, the flangers, the phasers, uh, these little boxes with knobs that you could just control and shape the sound. But unlike my guitarist friends at the time who were collecting the little boss pedals, I went on a little known site called uh, eBay and got a programmable multi-effects pedal. So the signal chain was fixed, but you could change which effects were on and their parameters. It was very awkward to program. You see, you have these little buttons to, change, to move around and change stuff. Um, but my, my best friend, Diego, realized that um, you could push the delay to three and a half seconds. And you could set it so when you push the, the foot pedal up, um, it set the feedback of the delay loop to 100%, making it into a loop pedal. Now, I know today, live looping is you know, practically a musical genre of its own. And there's plenty of dedicated hardware. Um, but back in 2000, 2001, there was like nothing, maybe just one rack mount unit from TC Helicon that cost you know, a couple grand. So um, Diego got one of these pedals, and we started a group called Tabula Raza. And I played all sorts of percussion and guitar and beatboxing and throat singing. And he played bass, flute, and singing. But the truth was we were really playing the pedals. So we had these, just these choreographies where we would change effects at the same time to create these song structures and polyrhythmic effects. But I felt like I needed even more 
sort of programmatic control. So we got this 26 channel, 26 channel mixer and connected everything we possibly could to it and set it up so you could send any signal anywhere um, and even send the pedals to each other and create these wild feedback effects. Um, so we did that for a couple years, but ultimately it was too complicated and unwieldy to perform with live. And so we created a more stripped down live bank. Um, after music school, I went to do computer science, but again, I spent more time uh, beatboxing uh, than actually going to school. I beatboxing in bars and clubs and weird circus festivals in the forest, and then I would put on a shirt and beatbox in a wholesome a cappella group. But I just couldn't get down with the way computer science was taught. There wasn't much coding, to be honest, and it was just very dry and static and theoretical. Um, until uh, in halfway through my degree, I found out that I could do a minor in music technology. And this is where I learned about physical computing, um, and especially Max MSP. So this was just an absolute game changer. It solved, um, wait, you guys have raised your hands, heard of Max MSP? I'm assuming yeah, that's what I thought. Um, uh, this is just a game changer um, coming from the kind of hardware system with this mess of cables because now I could set up my signal chain however I wanted. I could have as many delays as I want, loops as long as I wanted. But even more than that, there was this uh, notion of interactivity that you could take a sensor to control parameters or, or um, my favorite was using the signal of a performer to actually affect their own signal. Um, an example of that, uh, this is a performance. Um, so whenever the singer holds a note for three seconds, it captures the eight loudest harmonics in her voice and tunes some uh, resonant filters, which I'm then beatboxing through. And then we're improvising. But as much as I love music technology, I felt so burnt out from the computer science degree that in the end I decided, you know what, I think I'm going to follow the path of performance. And I literally ran away and joined the circus. Um, so I played uh, most notably in a, I was the beatboxer MC in a kung fu themed street circus group, but I also battled flamenco dancers, accompanied DJs. And uh, this picture in the corner here, that's not even a circus group. Those are my roommates at the time. <laughs> and so I literally thought this would be my life. I travel the world just beatboxing and repeating you know, silly comedy lines. But then one by one, all my circus collaborators started studying contemporary dance. And I remember um, when uh, a close, uh, my closest collaborator, Manu Sir, asked me to vocally accompany and be the soundtrack for his first choreography. And we were in this acoustically dry room and I was trying to do my sort of explosive sound effects, but he was doing all these subtle and bizarre movements and it just didn't work. So I knew exactly what I had to do. I dug up some old Max patches and I created a system with this very long delay that was slowly increasing in feedback so that it began with um, very one-to-one -one sound effects, but slowly became a, uh, a, a kind of layered uh, soundscape. So, whoops. Um, so I continued to, to work with the circus groups, but also start incorporating more of these interactive 
um, audio systems in, in, into the work with performers. But what I started to feel was that these complex and subtle interactions and sounds needed to be visualized. I did a little bit of work visualizing um, with Max MSP, um, but then someone told me about something called Open Frameworks. I see a smile over here. <laughs> Um, so Open Frameworks, uh, when I first heard of Open Frameworks, I said, oh man, I haven't done C++ in like five years since I finished my degree. I don't know if I remember it anymore. Um, but it only took me one time to know that this would be my tool of choice. Because unlike the black boxes of Max MSP, I could have direct manipulation of data at the lowest levels and, and just have like high performance graphics and an easy interface to work with all sorts of media from video to uh, images to graphics to sound. Um, and so I started making visuals with open frameworks. But then again, I felt like I wish there was a way that the visuals could be aware of the physical performers. So I started doing some research into um, IR sensors. And I dreamt up this whole system. It was going to cost me one or two grand. And it would have been super complicated to set up. Um, and hard to use. And you've probably guessed the punchline, because around then, Microsoft released the, the Xbox for Kinect. Sorry, Kinect for Xbox. Um, and about as soon as it was released, um, Adafruit put a bounty on it for a couple grand, whoever could hack the drivers. So within one month, um, there was full support for the Kinect and Open Frameworks. So I set to creating interactive video pieces with dancers. So this is a piece with video feedback. And the angle and scale of the, the projection is controlled by where the dancer is. Um, this is tracking the, the vectors of the movement of the dancer. And then in this one, it's, it's a particle system reacting to the dancer's movements. But what you can't see, or maybe can't see, is that these are all letters. And they're the letters of a poem. And the piece begins with, with him reciting the poem. And as he starts to move away, the letters all start to follow him like alphabet soup. And the way we created this piece was I had a sort of basic particle system. And then he would dance with it and then give me suggestions. Can, can it start from this? And these letters leave first. Maybe it moves along this type of curve. Um, and so every time he'd give me a suggestion, I would quit the system. And then I'd start typing like mad and try and turn the idea into reality, start up the app again, and then we'd iterate in that way. And so what I, I didn't know about live coding at the time, but that's what I was trying to do. The only problem was that I had to quit the app. And so then the dancer couldn't interact with the system while I was making changes to it. So I refined um, the technique. And this is with a dance company in New York called Eric Taylor Dance. And this led to me working with the um, legendary Miss Lauren Hill. I got to do audio reactive visuals for her. And it was great because the entire band, I got an audio signal from every member of the band. And then I could choose which visuals and what part of the projection were reacting to her voice or the drums or guitar solo. Here's the. Here's that. <laughs> So just one geeky aside for if, if there's any signal enthusiasts out there. Lauren Hill's voice is a really incredible signal. Just 
it's just different, you know, legendary. Um, but let, let's go uh, back in time. The first piece I actually created when I first got the Connect and Open Frameworks working together was a solo piece that was a synthesis of my work um, in uh, physical theater and dance and beatboxing and uh, interactive video. And that was called Body <laughs> And this is the piece that Iran was mentioning. Back in the day, when I'd send this video to people, it was impossible to convince them that there was no post-processing. So I got to take the, the performance on the tour. Um, and the first stop was Art and Code 3D, which was the Connect Hacking Conference put on by uh, Golden Levin and the Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon. And something uh, amazing happened during my performance there. And well, not amazing, but that is that the code crashed. And it crashed right in the middle. So if it had crashed at the beginning, I would have asked the audience, can I start again? And if it had crashed near the end, I would have just pretended that that's where it was supposed to end. But it crashed right in the middle, and it actually crashed at a point where the visuals go dark, and it's just ambient right before the buildup to the final climax. So I just I jumped off stage, I forced quit the app, and I just started debugging in front of the whole audience. So I commented out some code here. I changed some numbers there. It was a mad dash. I wasn't sure if it was going to work. I hit compile, and we all watched as the rainbow beach ball went. And it compiled. And I jumped up on stage, now, now full of adrenaline, and I finished the show. And the amazing part was multiple times throughout the weekend of that conference, people came up to me and they were like, hey, man, your show is pretty cool, but that part where it crashed, and then you debugged it, and then it worked, that made my weekend. I was like, really? And I was so curious, but it sort of planted the seed that, oh, it can programming be a performance practice? Anyway, when I first got off stage, um, this unassuming guy came up to me and he said, hey, you probably wouldn't be interested, but I have a video game company. You know, maybe we could work together. He gave me a card and it said, Iran Agozi, CTO of Harmonix. So the next stop on the tour was Harmonix, where I got to play uh, for the entire company during their lunch hour, um, which is a really interesting experience. Um, then I went to Colombia to play the International Image Festival, uh, to India to the Carnival for eCreativity, and then finally to Norway for the Pixel Festival, which is a really interesting open source software art um, sort of conference festival. And at Pixel, there was all these amazing and very strange um, performances, all with Linux. And um, one of them was this guy writing code in an Emacs buffer and creating these groovy beats. And after the show, I said, hey, man, what was that? That was incredible. And he said, oh, it's just a Haskell library I wrote, and then walked away. I guess he was in a rush, because I didn't even catch his name. But um, that was. Uh, that was Alex McLean, who is a pioneer in the live coding movement and the creator of Tidal Cycles, which is uh, used a lot at what are called algoraves, where people dance to algorithmically created music. Um, after the tour, I went to Harmonix to work on this incredible project called Fantasia Music Evolved, which was to take the classic 1940s uh, Disney movie Fantasia 
and make it uh, an interactive game where you could manipulate music. And so the, they hired me to come in and I couldn't believe it. They said, we want you to just make cool things where you manipulate music using the Kinect and there's cool visuals. I was like, are you serious? <laughs> okay. Um, so here's a little example of um, the game. Um, now, if you haven't tried the game, you should try it. It's extremely expansive. I can't possibly show. Um, you know what's coming. So this was uh, one of the things that I contributed to the game where the user can manipulate the sort of womp bass in a sound or some other by, um, as if it were sort of a late, I know it's pretty abstract. Um, and one memory I have at Harmonix, so I worked, uh, I did about three contracts with Harmonix and at the end of one of them, I don't know if it was the first or the second, but I sort of got this vibe like I needed to make like another good idea if I was gonna get another contract. And so I, I just started hustling and I ended up making five different interactive prototypes in five days. I remember on the Friday, uh, Ron and the other uh, execs came in and they kind of looked at my stuff. They said, oh, that's cool. You know, that doesn't work. Maybe this could work with that. And then after they left, Ron said, good work, man. I like this one prototype a day thing. And I went, oh no, oh no, I've set this precedent. But then I thought about it and I was like, no, this is sort of the most amazing thing that I love about this medium, that you can have an idea for an interactive audiovisual system and create it in a day and that people can interact with it by moving their hands in the air. Um, and th that is, sort of the magic that I've been after um, throughout my career. So um, I got to work creating interactive uh, gestural controlled instruments again. Um, this recently uh, with a company called The Wave VR. It's a social VR world where people go to concerts together. So this is from the point of view of the person who's in VR. Um, and they're remixing, oh, I should say, this is a LA producer, Toki Monsta, uh, first ever album released in VR. So the team took her album art and um, turned it into an entire world that people could explore. This is remixing drum samples from the album. Now in this one, each globe represents one of the stems, one of the tracks. So this, the user's holding the drum. And then these are different filters that they can put them into. This is the keys track. So VR, in a way, it, it is a successor to the Kinect in that it's this incredibly um, precise way to do gestural control. Uh, of course, you've got to hold things in your hand and wear uh, goggles on your face. Um, but so this was, this was actually five years, about five years after Harmonix. Um, but right after Harmonix, I was accepted into the School for Poetic Computation which is a, uh, you know someone? No? Um, which is a, a project of Taeyun Choi and Zach Lieberman and, and many others. 
And so this was the first class in, in 2013. It was a really incredible um, program. It was just this sort of deprogramming um, kind of education where you jumped from topic to topic. Sometimes the students taught the teachers. Uh, the class content changed within one lesson. Um, and one, the first assignment Zach ever gave um, was really amazing because he said, find a programming language you've never heard of or never, at least never used and just do something with it, anything. And so I kind of went down this rabbit hole of trying all these new languages. And that's where I found out about um, live coding. Now, I had heard some live coding, the sort of blips and uh, noise and sort of complex rhythmic stuff. But this, this was totally different. Um, this is some code from a language called Impromptu created by Andrew Sorensen. And this is called the study in Keith. And uh, it's inspired by uh, the jazz pianist Keith Jarrett. And the first two minutes are silent while he sets up the base algorithms for the structure of the piece. Um, and I love this because it's kind of got like a John Cage feel, but it's functional. Um, but I'll, I'll skip ahead here. Um, do I have sound? Oh, yeah. So this is so different from what you think of when you think of algorithmic music. And if you look over, right over here, what he's typing, this is like a super minimal Markov chain, right? So Markov chain is usually kind of like seen as a black box and you feed it tons of data and then you use it to predict the next term based on the last couple terms. But here he's writing it from scratch and then adding in to create chord progressions. And so I love this idea of sort of immediate programming and uh, it's almost artisanal, you know, and the data and the code is, is together. So this, this really was the moment for me when I realized that coding would be uh, my performance practice. Uh, because before when I thought I was bringing, um, when I was bringing code and performance together, really I would spend like a couple weeks head down creating an interactive system, and then I'd spend a couple weeks practicing with the system. So it was still separated in time. And there's a great paper called Programming in Time by Andrew Sorensen and Henry Gardner talking about how um, traditionally programming has been split into this sort of um, a problem to be solved, its implementation, and then a product to be used in the future. And this software, uh, software development ideology has just how everyone thinks about programming. But it's nothing to do with the hardware. It doesn't have to be this way. And so he sort of talked about this more ephemeral um, ephemeral kind of programming where it's direct agency. And so you're, you have ideas, you turn them into code, and in the moment, you start changing the sound waves or the photons in the room. And so I started to look for like-minded souls, and it turns out it's a very spread out international community. There's a little hub in England, in Mexico City, in Australia. Uh, but not too many people in New York. Um, so I ended up, we started a group with just uh, four of us. So there's um, Kate Siccio, who live codes dancers. So this is sort of following in the Merce Cunningham games of chance um, sort of idea, where she's algorithmically creating uh, choreographies that the dancers are reacting to in real time. Uh, and then there's Ramsey Nasser, who's created his own system for live coding uh, video games. So while someone's playing the game, he can change the mechanics of the game. Um, and then there's uh, Tom Murphy and myself, who uh, live, were traditional live coders, live coding uh, dance music and such. And so um, we're now about 10 core members, over 80 total members, 
and we've put on about 15 alga raves and two live coding festivals and we'd love to do one here. Um, so, so I want to talk about how different it is as a performer to, as a musician to live code than, than just when you're a, a, a human musician. Um, and so as a musician, you're always sort of in the moment. Um, you've got this muscle memory, your body is the instrument, and you have all these um, you know, internalized ideas of musical structures and, and culture. And so you're living in the moment, you know, you have a little bit of the past and a little bit of what could happen in the future, and you can be very fast and, uh, you know, emotional. Uh, but when you're live coding, the process is completely different. You're in your computer, you hear the music, you think of how you want to change it, and then you imagine how to turn that into an algorithm, and then how to type that in code fast enough so that when you evaluate the, the change, it makes musical sense. And if you listen to a lot of live coding music and you have a musical background, you'll notice that most of it doesn't follow um, kind of normal, the norms of musical structure at all. Um, and that's why. Um, but I really wanted to create something musical. And so I formed a duo with um, singer-songwriter Mei Chung. Um, and she has a background in jazz and she's a, a strong improviser. And what I realized was when I'm thinking about what to do, while I'm thinking how to turn into an algorithm, while I'm typing, I still hear her voice, um, can I say in the corner of my ear? Um, and her phrasing guides me to know when to make a change to the music, when to go halftime, when to change the key. Um, and so here's a, an example of some of the music we make. have these moments where we change at the same time and it, I don't know, has to. Um, yeah, and we've been lucky to play all over New York, um, LA, uh, touring in Mexico and Hong Kong, and just being uh, greeted with appreciation for this strange sort of improvisational electronic music that we do. People wear sunglasses to our shows, I don't know. So I want to take the next um, little bit to explain my process and how I've come to the audiovisual system that I'm going to be presenting you um, this evening. So just to give you an idea of kind of the basic way you make um, rhythms in live coding is it's a succession of repeated conditionals. So you might say, every fourth beat, play a kick drum. And then on the third beat of every four beats, do a snare drum. Uh, play two hi-hats every beat. So that's kind of very um, direct and one-to-one. -one. But I wanted to find a way to go one level higher and sort of um, get more emergent rhythms. So what I started doing was putting um, low frequency oscillators, sort of sine waves and such, um, and sampling them to choose from a list of drums. So here's a simple example with just um, three drums. You'll see as I change the frequency of the drum, 
you get some interesting uh, rhythms. So I started to push this and I had, you know, 10 drums that I sorted by hand from lowest to highest pitch, 20, 30, but I wanted more. I wanted like a hundred or a thousand drums and I knew I couldn't have them all in one line. So I had to find a way to have more dimensions. And while I was right around the time when I was trying to figure out this problem, this image turned up on the internet. Uh, circulating Reddit with the tagline, a computer made this art by itself. Um, spoiler alert, computer didn't make that art. Um, it was the DeepMind group at Google, and this came out of some research to try and figure out how the state of the art uh, neural networks for image, uh, object recognition in images worked. And so, you know, just to simplify it, Basically, playing these neural networks backwards makes them hallucinate and create these, you know, you know beautiful or grotesque, depending on your taste, uh, images. And one effect, uh, so this was called deep dream or inception. So one of the effects that um, this new aesthetic had was a lot of artists working with code or, or media artists started getting interesting in the potential of machine learning and AI. And I was at a, uh, an event at Dark Matter in Brooklyn, and I saw um, an artist named uh, Kyle McDonald, who's presenting some of his recent work. And he had all these clusterings of you know, words clustered by similarity, or um, scales, or images. And they all were clustered in this interesting way. Um, and then the last one was this giant you know, point cloud and as he dragged his mouse through it, I realized every point was a sample organized by similarity. And I was like, that's it. That's what I need. So I said, what's this called? What do you call that algorithm? And he said, T-SNE. So T-SNE stands for uh, T-Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding. The T hyphen actually stands for T hyphen Distributed. So, you know. It's a revolutionary algorithm and a revolutionary acronym. Um, and basically, what this does is it, it's a dimensionality reduction algorithm. Um, but in simplest terms, it puts things, uh, similar things close together and doesn't care about things that are different. So these are images. It's a low resolution image. And so I took some samples and I ran a TSNI on it. So here the uh, blue points are hi-hat, the red are snare, and the green are kick drums. So this is the algorithm in action. Every little dot finds its place. So it worked. So now I had to live code it. So I took 3,000 samples and I put everything. I put you know marimbas and vibraphones and trumpets as well as all my percussion samples. And I started live coding traversals through it. And it sounded like this. And I really, I memorized this geography. I knew where Marimba Island was. I knew where on the percussion continent to find the Darbuka or the Djembe. Um, but after working on it uh, for about two years, I figured out there was a better way to do it. And that was that if I took out all the kind of tonal samples, the marimbas and the vibraphones and the trumpets and just had more dry percussion sounds, what it was actually doing was organizing it, you know, from the lowest kick to the highest pitched hi-hat, you know. And it's just that the T-SNE tries to conserve space 
So it was crushing it into some sort of weird curve. And so what that meant, um, let's see in a second. It's obliterated. Um, basically, you could draw a curve through it. There we go. So you draw a curve through the distribution. And I tried all sorts of ways of curve fitting algorithms, but it just always was better if I did it by hand. And then you could unwrap it and then assign it to a grid. And now there's two meaningful dimensions. So along this way, it's the drums are getting from low pitch to high pitched. And then on this axis, it's variations within the same sort of frequency energy. And so then I didn't have to memorize anymore. I knew where, just numerically, where the, the, um, the drums were. Um, and so the live, I got commissioned, um, again, by the Wave VR to turn the live coding um, TSNE into um, a VR experience. And I'll just show you a little, some early sketches. So you're sitting on a, you're on a giant laptop and you're watching the TSNE being formed. And then, uh, so you get this, um, you see me code a little bit. Um, but then what's interesting is that the users get to enter, and this is a three-dimensional TSNE of samples, and make their own rhythms. So I started to think what other uh, musical structures, uh, what the TSNE would do to different kinds of musical structures. So this is all the uh, diatonic seventh chords in every key. And I was very proud of the TSNE because the chords find their friends. And it makes a circle. And so this is sort of a circle of fifths. And if you unwrap it, again, you get two dimensions, um, one where it's variations on the same chord. And then on the x-axis, whenever you move over one, uh, one note is different. If you move over two, two notes are different. And you're always moving towards the next key in the circle of fifths. So now I can create progressions without knowing what chords I'm playing, just by how far I want them to change harmonically. So then this is a T-SNE of uh, synth presets. I'm interpolating between the nearest seven to the mouse. And the reason that there's so few points is because uh, when you make a TSNE, you want to have ideally a lot of points. Uh, and I'm using the presets um, to compare. Um, is that every commercially, synth, commercially available synth that I've been able to find has modal parameters where there's switches or switching between waveform or modes. And you just can't interpolate or you get all sorts of clips. So these, I curated these because they all have their modal switches at the same place. So if you know a synth that is fully parametric, please come talk to me after the talk. Um, and this is a TSNE working on every possible uh, rhythm with eight beats. And again, the TSNE surprised me with the topology it found. 
because it basically made this sort of fractal grid so that all I had to do was rotate it um, and then assign it, just kind of clean it up. And then again, it has the property where if I move over by one, the beat is different by one beat. And if you move over by two, it's different by two. Um, I couldn't find any meaning in the axes, uh, but it is an interesting way to explore uh, rhythms. Uh, then I got a little distracted from music. This is a, a T-SNE grid of um, my former collaborator from Circus Days, B-Boy WD-40. This is every frame in a 15 second clip. And I don't have time to show you right now, but I've done some experiments where if you move through this at, an, at, a, um, at a fast speed, put like kind of triangle waves through it, you can get him to do all sorts of choreographies that, that he never did. Um, that's interesting. Uh, then I took um, this image of a flower and did a T-SNE of all the pixels. And the background is just blue to, to make it pop. So this is the T-SNE unwrapping the pixels. And it kills me every time that it tears here. I just feel like it could. But that's that the T-SNE is optimizing for things that are nearby being similar. So sometimes groups get broken up. Then I think I went too far because I did a T-SNE of the images in the sequence of the T-SNE of the pixels of the image of the flower. And by this point, people were just like messaging me like, you OK, man? <laughs> You sure are tweeting a lot about T-SNEs. Um, and, and like, truth be told, like, I was literally dreaming about T-SNEs at night. Um, so I started to think, what, it, what else can this new, this kind of new revival in AI and machine learning um, bring to, to musical creativity? So when Deep Dream first was released, I was really fascinated by the way it could take content and supervise, uh, superimpose new content in this sort of hallucinatory, like eidetic way that it, it knows about the shape of the tree and it, it fills it in. And I was like, I talked to, to some people working in the field and I was like, can we do this for sound? You know, I'd love to take the sound of a babbling brook and turn it into distant djembes or something. And they were like, no, this algorithm won't work on sound. Because this algorithm only understands spatial relationships, and it, it can't make sense of time. But it only took one more year till the same group at DeepMind created WaveNet. And so the real breakthrough of WaveNet um, is speech synthesis. Uh, it's kind of the best and most natural speech synthesis um, we have yet. And this just came out in 2016. But of course, I wasn't interested in speech synthesis. I wanted to hear some weird noises. Lucky for me, the lovely folk at Google Magenta, which is a, a group at Google devoted to finding how AI and machine learning can benefit artists and creativity, they felt the same. So they trained WaveNet on um, 400,000 individual sa audio samples of instruments playing one note. And you can see here this ridiculous encoding. This is the original spectrogram. And then like, you know, one, two, three. There's, you know, 10 to 15 features. And with that, they can reproduce the original um, waveform. So they're, it's happening on a waveform basis. And there's some crunchy uh, sort of artifacts that turn up, which of course I love. I don't know what's going on with the flugelhorn. Uh, but, but what was really cool is that you could say, I want something that's 20% bass, 30% glockenspiel, and 50% flugelhorn. And it's not cross-fading those sounds by amplitude. It's generating what it thinks um, the mix of those would be sample per sample. And so they released a uh, Max for Live plugin for Ableton Live. And they basically, you get 
you can pick different grids and you have four instruments and you can interpolate between them. And the, in the middle of these instruments, you get to these weird places where it's kind of not in tune because the tuning of a violin for a certain note is not the same as a tuning for, uh, say, a saxophone. So you can get these very strange harmonics and crunchy things. Um, and so I'm going to perform that for you tonight. Um, so I think this is a fairly good intro to my work. I want to spend the next hour going uh, deep into the philosophical implications. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm going to do a little setup where I, I switch the projectors, and then I'm going to perform for you. Thank you. 
Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Ron. That was amazing. Oof. So we're going to chat. Although I'm still sort of coming down from that. Um, I thanks. To, I had to bring it down at the end. Yeah, no, it was good. It was just kind of. Um, I was, I, I don't know if you guys had the same experience, but I was sort of wondering, like, do I look at the code? Do I look at the screen? Do I look, you know, it's like, because they were both very interesting. Well, so I wanted to have the code overlaid oh, yeah. on the screen. Uh, yeah. Um, but I couldn't find a text editor that would properly do transparency to the background without the text. Uh, and I didn't <laughs> want to learn Emacs for the show. <laughs> right. Uh, right. That's probably a good I'm idea. A guy, you know. You're a Vim guy. OK. Yeah. Well, we won't get into like editor wars right now, because uh, that's a whole. What's that? I'm using Vim key bindings. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Vim key bindings, so, so we're good. You're not, uh, OK, so look. <laughs> I think she started the war already. <laughs> yeah, don't start, the, don't start the editor war. Um, so uh, uh, boy, but, actually, but I have to say it was, it was cool seeing. I, th I thought it, it worked OK, because it was. Um, you know, co code on top of art might be um, might be a little, a little kind of too it's much. Busy. You know, it's pretty yeah. busy. Um, just to, out of curiosity, uh, what did? You, oh yeah. Right. Oh, turn the mic. Oh, turn your mic up. Um, so, out of the audience, who who spent more time looking at the code or or the who, who looked at the code a lot? Okay. And okay. then who looked at the at the around screen? Okay. Fifty fifty. That's pretty cool, right? So then that was the right thing to do. I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Just the, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, there we go. But then you get like the indigo that, yeah. Out of the box thinking. Um, <laughs> so there's a, there's a ton we can talk about. I could spend a while just asking you about details of the, of the code and what you were doing, but I'm going to resist doing that. Oh, yeah. um, uh, I also do uh, sort of live coding of a different sort, which is in my class. I actually code mm. in front of the class, and that's got its own set of terrors associated with it. Yes. You know, because it's all MIT students. So as soon as you type one wrong character, they're just like, hey, that's that. you don't need to do that. I was, I was pretty low typo rate today. Right, yeah, that was good. But at the end, I was like, what? <laughs> um, I will ask you some sort of broad questions about that. Do you, um, I'm sort of wondering what's going on in your head as, as you're essentially constructing um, this piece, you know, and it starts, it's, you know, it starts nice and easy, right? There's not a lot of code on the screen. There's, you know, you get the metronome set up and you get your, your first basic set of beats going. Um, but then, you know, you're building up more and more. And so I'm wondering what's going on through your head as that's happening. And also, does it ever get overwhelming? Like, do you ever forget, like, where did I put that code? Or, or is it all fairly clear in your mind how it's all ar kind of architected and what it's doing? Um, well, because I'm improvising, like, sometimes I'll get to a point, like, today I got to a point where I went, I wanted to stop the, the, the drums and then immediately take out the, the root note of the chords. And I did it, and then I went, I said, oh, this time I put the chords at the top. Uh -huh. And they're not beside this, this, um, so all those little chunks of code are called temporal recursions. Mm -hmm. um, it's just schedules itself to be called in the future at a certain time. Oh, so, so each one is sort of a self-contained unit? Um, not everything. There's some like one-off commands. Like uh -huh. I'm, sending, uh, I'm, I'm sending messages to this computer on how to control the visuals. Right. Um, but Listen. mostly, yeah, I set up a temporal recursion. You give it a name, and then you tell it to call Self back in the future. And then the ways you can create rhythms are you put conditionals in there. 
um, only play on these beats. Mm -hmm. Or um, the way I get the really interesting stuff is I'm actually changing the how soon to call itself back in the future. So it calls itself, and then it decides, oh, next time I'm going to call myself an eighth note or maybe a triplet. And that's where you get the more interesting right. sort of things. And so you can sort of get these sort of dynamically forming polyrhythms. Yeah, and then the most interesting thing, which um, I didn't get to do, is where you can have one call a different function instead. And that function might call it back. Uh -huh. And so they're sort of feeding off each other and passing each other parameters. Uh -huh. um, but I kept it pretty uh, right. self-contained. For now, yeah. yeah. Um, I also noticed, um, so you, use, you probably noticed, but you're using random here and there. Yes. Uh, but sparingly. I, yeah, which I thought was kind of cool. You know, you can um, you can you can get quickly carried away probably with randomness, but it's it's nice to see that. Well, so I actually don't like randomness. Mm -hmm. I try and avoid it. But the one place where I really like it is in um, in the parameters of the oscillators and specifically the frequencies. Mm -hmm. So I'll say the frequency of this is um, it takes two beats for this wave. Right. to play, mm -hmm. but one out of three times, it's, it takes three beats for it to play. And that, that's where I find the random really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, and then maybe I'll use it in um, the amplitude of the wave, and just give it two. So it's sometimes it's playing nearby, and then sometimes it'll go a bit further. But I don't, I don't like just random. Um, Right. It's another, it's another style. Yeah, interesting. Um, the, so, so if you're, uh, and I don't, I don't do much improvising myself as an instrumentalist, but, um, you know, but, but I imagine when you are um, improvising, you know, there's a lot going in, in your head, but it's, it's probably not necessarily just the individual note. You know, like John Coltrane is not thinking like C sharp, D, F natural. Right. You know, he's sort of he's thinking larger shapes, yes. and, and forms as as this this all is happening. And of right. course, you know, generally you're conforming to um, to a particular tune. You're you're playing with a certain set of chord changes. Um, but I'm wondering with this, it's it all seems very detailed, you know. And um, and do you where do you think you are so, sort of on this on this arc? Not of, not Coltrane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not yet. But you know, on this arc where, where initially, you know, this is a new instrument essentially, right? right? And so yeah. you start off and you're just doing scales and you're practicing the individual notes and you're getting accustomed to your instrument and, le and learning how it works. And then over time, you are able to start thinking in larger, uh, larger scale stru structures. Right. And I'm wondering if there's an analog between sort of that, uh, you know, learning and development of um, and cultivating of, of yourself as a musician in the sort of traditional, traditional way versus the system that you're working with here? Yeah, so there is, but the problem is I'm also a coder. So I'll practice with a system and start getting somewhere. And then I'll think, oh, maybe if I just change this. And then I'll totally change the system. And I would say almost 100% every show is not the same system as the last show. So you can't, so. Well, and wait, sorry, and when you say the system, you, you don't mean like the particular code you're typing now. You mean the underlying yeah, sort so, of engine, so to speak, of Right, like how so it's you can see like uh, there's some functions I call. Right. Um, so that's changing. And so extempore, which is the, the language I'm using, um, is like a, a bilingual language. So I'm writing a scheme here. Right. Mm -hmm. But some of the functions I'm calling are in what's called xtlang. And this is like a low-level language like C, but still written like Lisp. And so I've built this whole system for you give it an x, y point and a nearest number of nearest neighbors, and it'll, it'll find those nearest neighbors in the, in the grid. Yeah. And then based on how far away they are, um, kind of share the uh, amplitude and the panning. And all that is written in this lower level. Yeah. And I'm constantly changing that too. So the semantics are changing, the function is changing, um, and I keep saying I want to, you know, stop and then just practice with it, but it never happens. So there's that, um, but also to your point about, you know, um, Coltrane's not thinking of what the specific note is. 
I don't, is it, I don't know if it was him who said, they asked him his, his uh, advice for young musicians. And he said, you know, learn your scales and then forget all that bullshit. <laughs> right. um, and so, like I said, there's the kind of like declarative, like play this note now, play this drum now. Yeah. Um, and I'm, one, I'm at least one step above that yeah. where I'm shaping waves using kind of amplitude and frequency modulation to create these complex waves and then sampling from them rhythmically to pick notes from scales. Yeah, and, and that, then, that really seems like this, this pretty nice ingenuity of, and we, I, I think what we saw here initially is the grid. It's the, your unrolled t grid. That's the right? unrolled t -sneed, then it rolls back up, and then it goes to the three dimensions. Uh, right, yeah. right. But in terms of, of how you organize your samples, it is, it, that's essentially a thing I'm that always, lets you. I'm always giving numbers to the grid, regardless of what it's showing. Right. Yeah. But, but sort of, uh, but in terms of just like you're saying, you don't really choose a note anymore. You know, yeah. what you're sort of, th you, you are thinking one level higher now because you, you essentially have this sort of spatial organization of sound. Yeah. And now you're thinking of traversing through that as opposed to saying, I want this one particular hi hat. Yeah, and there's even more than that because I can't even say I want this particular hi hat because there was one drum that I really wanted to play because it goes like, <laughs> it's really cool. Um, and it's at position X14, Y0. But every time That's I play it. That's the best position for it. <laughs> well, it's memorable. Yeah. Right? Um, I will always remember that. <laughs> you should remember forever. Um, but what else I'm doing is, so I'm, I'm creating these chord progressions by putting the sine waves through that grid of chords. Yeah. But when every one of those drum samples is tagged with the approximate pitch, and when I play a chord, only drums that are tagged with one of those four pitches are, are going to be chosen from the algorithm that finds the you know, end nearest neighbors. Yeah, yeah. So if I put in 14-0 like I did at the end, and I was like, oh, come on, it's got to hit the chord where it plays that sound. But it didn't. So I can't choose the exact I see. Um, sound. Yeah. So yeah. it's almost like a limitation of the system that you've built yourself yeah. in order to be able to achieve higher levels. Well, so when I play with um, May, with Scorpion Mouse, yeah. sometimes we're jamming, and she's like, can you change that third chord? Like, I don't like the way the dominant goes to the three. And I'm like, ah, uh, can you tell me when the third chord? Like, I'm like, no, nope. you know? Nope, so I don't have that. I'm too high level that when I work with, um, you know, human musicians, uh, it's, there's a, definitely a language barrier where I'm trying to figure out, like, what do they expect? Yeah. Or how could I do that? Yeah. Uh, but it's also a really good challenge that helps me grow is trying to work with musicians. Yeah. As opposed to, say, you, right? <laughs> Me or, or like, like, so I've been to a bunch of uh, live coding conferences, and they'll have, like, ensemble, live coding ensembles. Yeah. Like, holy, wow. Yeah. You cannot tell. I don't even think they know what sound they're making, right? Because everyone can make every sound. Um, oh, so it just, it just all blends together into this wild and... Uh... I mean, everyone has access to oscillators and samples and yeah. noise and filters, and they're all typing they're all away. away. Yeah, so. Um, yeah. I'd let, any questions? I thought I'd open up to questions in the audience. And let's see, there is, um, there's a microphone going around. Oh, cool, okay. So speaking to the mic so we can get the question recorded. But yeah, go ahead, here. Oh. What happens when you get an error on your code? Does it just not? play that part or not Yeah, I did, I did yeah. um, miss a parameter. Um, and so, when it, so because it's a dynamic language, when it goes to call itself in the future and the new version has an error, it just doesn't play it and I get an error in the console. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's another version. So that's, I'm using the dynamic scheme language. You can also do all this with the low level language. And if you make an error there, it doesn't replace the function. If it doesn't compile, it won't do it. Um, so in a way, that's better. But then you have to program with types. And I just can't, I just can't do it. It slows me down. Right. Yeah. yeah. And with this being interpreted, it doesn't know that there is a bug in it until it actually nope. executes it. Until it executes it, right. and then so it like, stops. Wah, wah. Yeah. Uh, OK, yes, uh, over here. Yes. Yeah. I just wait for the mic, yeah. Thank you. Um, so if, 
in an ensemble situation, some of the music that you're performing today, so rhythmically is, you know, is kind of the basis for it. So what, do you tr do you synchronize clock with other people, or ha ha or or? And I'll ask separately if you're playing with a drummer. I don't know if you do that, but if you're playing with a with a live percussionist, kind of what's your concept on the rhythmic framework? Um, I try to avoid playing with live drummers. <laughs> it's happened, but it's just it's never gonna it's never gonna work because um, I can't I can I can't groove with them, you know. Um, if you tell me exactly like you want the snare uh, a 30 second note late, I can do that easily. Um, but you know, natural drummers have like um, a groove, the way they speed up and slow down, and they move with the whole band. And so basically, it's like they have to like drum to a click, except it's not a click. It's my really strange rhythms. Um, and I just think frequency-wise, there's too much overlap. So. I, uh, oh, so and then for the when you when I work with other live coders, yes, yeah, synchronize um, clock, synchronize clock. Um, sometimes it's a problem because um, there's a lot of really popular live coding languages um, like Tidal and Super Collider and Chuck and um, what's one I'm missing Sonic Pi, and these ones often will work with each other. But I'm kind of like lone wolf here. Extempore. I mean, there's some other users around the world, but mainly it's the the creator and his collaborators in Australia. Oh, okay. So sometimes it is a bit tough, um, and I'll just send OSC messages saying like, "Hey, keep keep up to this time. You should be here." Yeah. Cool. Um, how about uh, over here? Just kind of working our way back. Um, that. The VR Tisney experience mm -hmm. that you showed, um, was that being live coded as well? Um, ha. Huh. Or is it something, like, could you live kind code of. VR performance? So I actually, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, I'm bad at faking things. I always want it to actually be generative and interactive. So I built a system in Unity whereby whenever I was live coding, I was live coding the system in Unity and I was procedurally creating um, animation events so that it captured my performance and re actually replay it. Oh, and it would also send the code that I had typed and then type it in Unity. <laughs> so it's absolutely, and no one, people who saw it were just like, that's a video, right? But it was yeah. right. Our friend Adam. Oh, yeah. 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 But it was real. Yeah. Real. Whatever that means. Um. Um, let's see. Let's go over here. Hi. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm really interested in new kinds of live performance. And I'm wondering what you think the vibe of Algo Rave can do. Or, or what's a new kind of experience that could come out of this kind of live music performance? Well, um, traditionally, like back in 2012, um, the way people danced, there was like an algorithm dance, and it was just like a bunch of geeks. You had beer in one hand, and you're reading the code and kind of going like this. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's pretty boring. Uh, but now, so we've been doing these shows in, in New York and, and all kind of lifting our chops levels up and posting on all sorts of weird lists. And now we get all these sort of like tech savvy raver kids. We don't know where they came from or how they found us, um, but they just dance. They love this weird um, kind of alien music. Um, and the vibe is really good. And we're going to, um, tomorrow, I'm missing uh, our Algo Rave at iBeam in New York. Um, and on April 20th, we're going to play our biggest show ever at um, this legendary, it's called Performance Space in New York, and it's been like a uh, kind of a breeding ground for experimental performance and dance since the 80s. And they just made this new venue, and they reached out to us, and they are like, we want to try an algorithm. And we were like, do you know what it is? Are you sure? <laughs> um, but they have two 14K projectors and seven 7K projectors. So you are going to be blinded by code at this show. <laughs> um, 
And it's, it's in collaboration with a group called Baby Castles that do uh, indie video games. So there's going to be arcades everywhere. There's going to be people um, wearing arcades coming on the dance floor. And you could actually play the arcade on them. So I feel like this feels like a kind of futuristic that like, hey, there's a lot of geeks now. Um, and sometimes they like to dance. <laughs> we like to dance. It's OK. Right, yeah. Uh, who else? There were some, some back there. Um, let's go all the way in the back. Um, I was wondering what your kind of relationship with the audience is when you're performing. Because like, on the one hand, like, live performance is very, like, you're aware of you know, your audience, that you're being watched. But um, on the other hand, when I'm coding, I tend to just zone out what's around me. So I was wondering where you sort of are on that spectrum. Yeah, um, for me, this is the, the tragedy of live coding. You know, I'm, I come from a background of being like a very live and physical performer and just being keenly aware of the audience, you know, more than knowing they're watching me, just really um, feeling the vibe. And yeah, you, you can't do it when you're coding. You, you can barely. You can barely hear the music when you're coding, really. I mean, it's still going in your ears, but you're, you know, you're just so razor focused on like, how do I get the next thing to happen, that it, you're definitely not embodied. You know, if anything, it's the opposite. And like I said, it doesn't matter how you type the keys; no one will will feel it, right? You know, sometimes I hit the eval button extra hard. That's like the the one action moment in live coding is evaluate. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, so, um, so this will, what my dream was for this performance, but I can't find anyone who will leak, leak one to me. I want to get a magic leap so that there's no laptop and that I'm looking at the audience maybe and the code is floating somewhere there. Uh -huh. So that is, that's my next step. I tried it with the HoloLens and I had such a headache that I like, couldn't code for two days, so I was off the there table. There might still be a while before yeah. you get what you really need. But, but I think that would be, that would to me seems like it could be the solution. That'd be one solution. And the second is, I keep, get, when you, I keep getting to this point where I'm live coding. Like sometimes I'll live code and it'll be really algorithmic, like all sorts of like loops and iteration and nested if statements and these really emergent properties. And then as I find what's cool in that, I start you know, abstracting it into these little functions. And I start just using these little functions like instruments. And then I say, hey, how many functions am I really using? 10? And so it makes me wonder if there's a way to build a system in virtual reality, for instance, or, or mixed reality, where you're coding, but you're physically moving around. Uh, and oh. yeah. Like if there was a notion of taking little chunks of code yeah. and actually physically locating yep. them, which might also just help you spatially think of, of the music and the space and structurally what's going on. Yeah, and then if it was, again, magic leap, then I, it's, like, it's like I'm here, the code is here, and I'm putting it around. That would be cool. Yep. Give me five years. Level of one. OK, and then there's one question right at the very back. Hi. So your um your t a comment first. Your Tisni and a Tisni reminded me of Escher. So oh um, wow. Thanks for that. Um, so I just started engineering school, um, but I'm also a massage therapist and a musician. So something I think about often is when I'm sort of moving my clients like through body movements. I'm usually thinking like I wish I could hear or see their stickiness. And so because mm. there's um. Because of the connect you were talking about, I'm wondering, is, is there anything you're thinking about in healthcare applications at all? Yeah, I've always wanted to build a, a connect app that's like, hey, you're slouching. You know, like, you slouched for 95% of today <laughs> um, or, or something. And I never got around to it. Um, I don't know if connect is, is the best way. It's not very. Um, precise to that level. Like, I think these little tightnesses are, are really precise. But I have, I did see um, a new technology recently. I forget what it's called, but it looks like a little, like one of those Apple mouse things. 
and it sticks on your back right here. Oh, you guys know what it is. And it measures the angle of your spine, and it'll like buzz you if you slouch too much. <laughs> um, and so I want to get it. I don't know if I'll, I'll be able to stand it. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot. Like, um, I recently started using the, the, the Muse um, headband. I've been super skeptical of EEGs. Um, uh -huh. But this one, it, it's, it's pretty impressive for the one little task it does. Um, and I sort of was thinking about using, the Muse is an EEG headset, uh, kind of consumer grade, very low spatial resolution, but supposedly will tell you if you're, um, no, I wouldn't say supposedly. It definitely tells you when your mind is active and when you're um, chill and focused. Mm -hmm. um, and I've even tried live coding with it. So I thought maybe if I had that and that was an input into the chain, there could be a little bit of, of the user's experience. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how that uh, answers your question, but, but I'm, I'm interested. Like, you know, as a performer, um, you know, I think, I think the, like, the current state of computers is like, the less you use them, the healthier you, you are. Um, but unfortunately, in 2018, there is nothing you can do that's useful without a computer. Um, so I feel like it's the computer that has to change. And you can all, you can all come up and see my keyboard later on. Very um, ergo keyboard. Very ergo keyboard. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, let's see, uh, back over there. Yes, you. Uh, so I have two questions. One is, is there any situation where you change what you described as the system or like the underlying functions live? And then my second question is, how do you teach this? Or how would, uh, how would someone go about learning this? Does it require uh, like extensive experience improvising in other music or uh, um. in music in general? Wait, uh, say, say the first question. What was the first question? Uh, oh, the, uh, the first question was, uh, so you talked about how so you sometimes oh, yeah, change I remember. the underlying system. I, remember. Um, um, I try to avoid that live. I do it all the time at home, uh, but it's definitely risky. Because if you make a mistake at the low level, and I don't mean like a doesn't compile mistake, I mean like a, it's a not memory managed, the low level one. So you could create a memory leak in real time while you're coding. Oh. Um, and I've also created like, I've just like done something recursive where I call a function and I didn't realize that that function calls a function that sometimes calls that function and just blow up the stack. So, but I, th I would like to do that. I think that's like as cool as it can get to change that low level stuff. And I did use, um, Unity for the visuals today because I, I'm always toying with making this into a VR experience. But Extempore actually has full, um, it has um, Nano VG and OpenGL and uh, even an open source video game engine. So you can do all the visuals in it. So it's a really, so the, I think the most interesting thing is where you build a system, then use the high level language to put some patterns into it. And then you change the system with those patterns in it. Oh, okay. um, and then the second thing was. So, oh, uh, the second thing is how do you teach this stuff? How do you teach this stuff? Oh, it's great fun. Um, if you're learning on your own, I would not recommend extempore. Um, I mostly wouldn't recommend extempore to, to anyone. Like, uh, <laughs> no, well, I mean, because the. So, like, I would never join a club that would accept me as a member. Yeah. Like that, no, that no. It's, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's more like. A, Oh, what's his name? Fear and Loathing. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Hunter Thompson. At the beginning of his book, he says, I would never recommend drugs to anyone. They just worked for me. <laughs> um, and yeah, so, so the creator of Extempore, he specifically said, you know, there's this trend of like um, easy, easy to use live coding tools. And this is just saying like, no, this is going to give you all the possibility and okay. all the power there is. Um, and it's really, really incredible. I mean, he controls a robotic telescopes with it. Um, so you're saying maybe this is like the second thing you should learn. Yeah, well, I mean, look, if you, if you have a strong engineering background, like 
you'll, you'll figure it out easy, you know? But you're, if you're talking about jump into it easily, there's these other languages, like especially Sonic Pi, um, which is Ruby, and just um, made kind of with musicians in mind. And it's very easy. You don't, it doesn't matter if you have a background in improvisation. Um, and then there's other ones like Tidal, which is this Haskell language that's all combining these little operators to create these emergent rhythms. And that you could just mess with the numbers and the order of the functions and just see what you like, you know? So there's languages out there where you could download it tonight and start making cool beats. Um, but extempore is more like a full, it's not a, it's not a library on top of a language, it's its own language. Um, and, oh, and then just the other answer to that question is, on Thursday night, Jason is actually oh, teaching yeah. a class about this. Yeah. You know? so, uh, so folks who are attending will, I think, will leave the class essentially having a basic feel for how it works and being able to make their own live coded beats. Yeah. And um, usually what I find when I teach, I teach like the very basics, like specify what note when kind of thing. And everyone takes it in their own direction. And half of the things people do, I'm like, I've never thought of doing that. So. Which actually is, it kind of um, reminds me of something I think you said when we, when we were working at Harmonix, which was um, like what, one of the best parts of, of this kind of very rapid coding is actually the, the accidents and the mistakes, yeah. you know, and the bugs. And when a bug turns into a feature or a bug turns into sort of a new interesting artistic concept that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise, and then you save it and, you know, all my errors are better than my ideas, so <laughs> I preach it. Um, and that actually kind of brings me to a sort of a high level, a higher level question that mm -hmm. I thought maybe we, um, you could um, talk about, maybe end with because we're pretty close to out of time. But um, you know, you've taken us through your whole uh, life's journey, <laughs> yeah. which was you know amazing to see actually how it all all you know started. Um, and how one thing led to the other, and this idea triggered, you know, something that happened to you years later. Um, and I love the, you know, how there's a there's an overall overarching arc of creativity, and 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 you know, in design, and also there's a lot of creativity in the small, with like you know, you're thinking about how to be creative on a second to second basis, with uh -huh. what we just saw here. But my question really is, what happens when you get stuck? Like, what do you? Does that happen to you? Do you ever have writer's block or coder's block or, you know, or, or something like that? And if so, how do you get past it? And, and what, what is sort of what is your creative process for coming up with, with new ideas? No, my problem is the opposite. Like I have too many ideas. It, it never, <laughs> it just never ends. And so, um, you know, these days I'm, I'm sort of trying to, to not be creative and just work on execution. Um, because, you know, I'll start working on something and then I'll think of something else and I could just, you know, just keep coming up with new ideas. Okay, but so, so, all right, so it's awesome you don't have that problem. Some of us might have that problem okay. every once in a while. Like, what do I do next? Oh. Do you, so what, what would you, what would you say, like, what helps you? How did you get to the point where, like, you, you know, you're essentially, you have too many ideas? Oh, I don't know. I think I was always like that. I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I just can't, you know, like, I just can't, I mean, I get stuck in the subway and I see a subway commercial and it gives me an idea uh -huh. or something. I just, I. Okay, write that down, everyone, subway. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm really hesitant to give advice because I don't know uh, why I have all these ideas, but one thing I can think of, I don't know if it's, the what's the result, uh, the ideas are the symptom of the way my mind works. But I kind of, I kind of have never had a very normal life. Like I'm constantly uh, changing. Um, you know, I I freelance. I work lots of contracts. I'm always changing my, you know, sleep cycle, mm -hmm. uh, traveling, and your environment. Environment, yeah. yeah. I'm not one to just stay, like I tried, I tried a full-time job about a year ago. Mm -hmm. I did one year and I just, I just couldn't do it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's helpful to other people. 
Um, well, it, just to, so just to my take on it from looking at what yeah. you've done, I think maybe one way to interpret it is that um, you have you have done a lot of different things and had a lot of experiences, you know. But the way I think, or I guess the way I think Jason's mind works is that um, he essentially uses every every slight little opportunity that comes his way, whether it's what he had for breakfast or just you know a blinking sign on the road. Especially at, blinking signs. Especially blinking signs on the road. But sometimes what you have for breakfast, as, <laughs> as a way of, um, you know, everything is input. And, yeah, and every, everything is sort of is going in. And, um, and you know, changing your environment a lot and, and trying all these different things, I think, all kind of contribute. But what, what I see happening is that there is this wonderful feedback cycle sort of happening, mm. you know, throughout your journey where, uh, where something happens here and then you, you know how to use it later. And then that causes something else to happen, and then you know how to use it later. And I think all those things essentially help feed on, on each other to, um, you know, to essentially make make this happen. You know what? You just made me think of something. Something I, I did notice about myself that I don't really see other people doing mm -hmm. is that I give a lot of attention to unimportant details. Unimportant details. Yeah. Yeah. Attention to unimportant details. Yeah, like texture on the floor or, or how light reflects somewhere or these kinds of things or the sound at a, as you're walking down a hallway at a particular spot sounds a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. That, maybe that. Cool. Okay, <laughs> so will that, I think, with that I think we'll have to okay. stop for tonight. Thank you so uh, much. Thanks so much, Jason. Thanks yeah. for coming. It was great having you. <laughs>